We're so glad you're here this morning. If you want to stand, we're going to worship this one. We're going to worship through song to kick us off today. Thanks for being here. We're so glad to have you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are here with us. Thank you that you meet us in our moments of joy, in our moments of pain, in our moments of brokenness, in our moments of celebration. God, you are here. Holy Spirit, work in our midst today. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand more of who you are. God, 
God, may we get a fresh glimpse of your goodness and your grace today. Thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for inviting us into your story. You are so good. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
church earlier this year it's been out since like the mid 2000s and I shared this in the first service just in the reflection aspect of this song it, it carries so much when we talk about rapping being wrapped in the arms of the father and being kept safe from harm harm doesn't necessarily look like one specific thing I know it's very easy to think harm we think God keep me safe from car accidents keep me safe from wrecks keep me safe from traumatic experiences but sometimes when we talk about being wrapped in the arms of the father and being kept safe from harm harm can look different it can literally be us just stepping out of the will of God sometimes it could be us trying to figure out life on our own sometimes harm comes in ways that actually look enticing and look really really good and and I, I know that we come from different walks of life and different experiences when we sing this on this morning and when we say father wrap me in your arms and keep me safe from harm but whatever it is I just want to encourage you all with that on this morning God why, why am I for those of us that might come in and, and maybe we don't easily identify what it is that we need to be kept from it's a matter of us just being kept in general and I want us to reflect on that this morning. It doesn't have to be crazy. Life doesn't necessarily have to be in shambles. It's simply the fact that we have a safe space, a home that we can come to, and we are safe. Psalms 91 and 1 talks about it, us dwelling in the secret place of the Almighty. And as we do that, we shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We're covered in that. For some of us, being wrapped comes from the fact that we're going through emotional issues. We might be struggling mentally, and, and we just need God to keep our mind in the right form. God, I need you to keep me on the, the straight and narrow. I, I, I need you to help me to not lose it today because my temper is short or because emotionally I, I'm offended easily in this season, whatever it is. Some of us, when we talk about being wrapped in the arms of the Father, it's simply I got a job to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And Lord, I just want to be a good steward and an example of what it is to be your love, to be your representation when I go out there. For some of us, being wrapped in the arms of the Father is literally that we need to feel a loving touch on this morning. Maybe you've dealt with neglect in your life. Maybe you've dealt with rejection. Maybe you've just grown up and you had people around you, but you always felt alone still. Here's the beauty of being wrapped in his arms. It covers a multitude. It literally covers all of those things and more. So I want us to sing this again. And whatever it is that you've come into the space with on this morning, 
I want you all to receive that from the Father right now. So God, as we say, wrap us in your arms. We ask that you bring comfort. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wow. And his healing power is flowing through this room right now. Wrap me. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. It's coming off as he chooses to. Wrap me in your arms as he embraces you. Wrap me in your arms. Because we need the love of the Father to wrap us. Yeah. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. So, Father, we receive now that embrace. We receive the embrace of our firm foundation on this morning. Waves might come and winds might blow, but God, you have us protected as you wrap us in your arms. Thank you, Jesus. When rain came and wind blew, when my house was built on yeah, it's safety. I'm safe with you. to move, but we're just going to jump into this real quick. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. And I'm safe, I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it. Come on, if you know what, sing it. Rain came. Rain. Time, sing it out. Here we go.
So God, we thank you that as we are wrapped in your arms, we can rest assured that you won't fail, that you cover us, that you keep us, that you hear us, that you see us, that you love us. We can stand strong in who you say we are. And more importantly, we can stand strong on who your word says that you are, Lord God. You are a firm foundation. You are a pillar of hope. You are the light. You are the living word. You are a father. You make ways out of no ways. You break chains. Lord God, you, you literally move mountains. You bring healing, you bring recovery, you bring deliverance. So God, we just say thank you now. And Father, for those of us that have come in carrying stuff on this morning, whether it be hopelessness, or for those of us who've come in with confusion, cloudy and, 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 and foggy minds, God, I just pray right now that you will begin to break it up in this space now. I pray for those of us who've come in with hearts of stone, that you will give us hearts of flesh so that we can receive your word on this morning morning so that we can receive your truth this morning in order for us to go out and be everything that you've created and called us to be. So Father, we receive your love now. Father, we receive your peace now. Father, we receive your joy now. We receive your truth now. We receive your words over us now. Father, we receive your safety now. And Lord, we just ask God that you will bless the word coming forth on today. We pray for Pastor Bryce. We ask that you will speak through him, Lord God, in this time and in this season, Lord God, we love you, we thank you, we honor you, and we say thank you for being a firm foundation that will never fail. Jesus, you are worthy of all the praise, the glory, and the honor, and it's in your name we pray, amen. You all may be seated at this time as we transition to our announcements for today. Good morning, ASC. Oh, man, I, this, this, 9 a.m. was better than this. Good morning, ASC. Good morning. Awesome. Nice to have everyone here. For those of you who I haven't met, uh, my name is Temo. I'm a friend here at ASC. Uh, and I just wanted to welcome uh, everyone. It's a packed house today. Um, yeah, if, if uh, th there's some spaces up here in the front for, for those of you in the back. Um, yeah, so feel free to, to find a seat. Um, and I just have a couple of announcements I wanted to, to share with us. Um, so first, starting this Wednesday, uh, we'll be having our Summers in the Park out in Green Lake, uh, which I know a lot of folks are excited about. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I know some of us need to get that tan going, so uh, that'll be a perfect time to do it. Uh, it'll be Wednesday uh, at Green Lake, and we'll have more info on our socials and on our, uh, on our website. So uh, for the exact location where we'll be meeting, uh, you can find that there. Um, and secondly, next Sunday, um, we'll have a, uh, a church social after, our, after this service, after the 1045 service, uh, where we'll get to meet, hang out with folks, uh, and uh, yeah, just get to know each other uh, more after the service as well. Uh, lastly, if you are new here at ASC, um, we'll have a QR code up, but then there's also QR codes in other spots as well. Uh, feel free to scan this. Uh, this is a way that you can connect with us, uh, whether that's uh, learning more about what we have going on through the weeks, um, but, uh, but also, yeah, opportunities for, for you to serve as well if that's something uh, that you'd like to do. Um, and then this, this next part is mostly talking about uh, giving and, and generosity here at ASC. Uh, I covered in the first part uh, an important aspect of our church here, which is community, meeting with each other, not just on Sundays, but also throughout the week. Uh, and th the second part is uh, another big pillar of ours here at ASC, which is generosity. Uh, we love being generous with our time, with our resources, with our finances. Uh, and we also want to invite uh, those of you uh, who call this your home and community uh, to step into that as well. Um, so th there are ways to give. Um, we'll have AS aseattlechurch.com slash give, uh, or you can find it in our, uh, in our app as well. Um, and so uh, I'd love us all just to close our eyes and extend your, uh, open your hands as I, as I pray this prayer I came across uh, this week over us and over our finances as a church. Father God, you are the giver of all good things and your work, your word made, makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May these gifts bring shelter to the houseless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. Just as you multiplied the offering of fish and loaves that were freely given for others, we pray that you multiply these, our offerings to you, and accomplish with them more than we could ask or imagine. We give freely and not from compulsion, 
for there is nothing we could give that matches your glory and majesty and the great gift of your son, Jesus, and of the Holy Spirit, which guides us daily. All we have is yours, Father, and we ask that you would use us and all we have as you will. Amen. All right, awesome. Well, now is the time for, if there are any kids still here, uh, you could uh, go upstairs and uh, meet the rest of the kids that are already there. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, feel free to turn to your neighbor and say hello to someone you didn't uh, come with, meet someone new, and, uh, you know, we'll transition into the sermon after that. Awesome. All right, everybody, come on back, come on back. Come find your seat. Come on back, everybody. Come find your seat. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. My name's Bryce, if we haven't got a chance to meet, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And it looks like we had a small, like, 9 o'clock service. Yeah, here y'all are. Y'all came to the 1045. Cool, cool. Really glad you're here. Uh, I see a couple new faces. Welcome. We are a church that's trying to learn how to follow Jesus in our ordinary life meaning just letting him inform us how to live. And we're trying to do it together. We're trying to make friends. I hope you uh, show up for some of our Wednesday night stuff. We're going to be at Green Lake. Some of you like to swim in Green Lake, which is always shocking to me. Uh, But we're just going to hang out and hope that you can be there. We got a Sunday social next week. Raise your hand. How many of you last week were at the Sunday social? Were you there? Were you there? There was like a, there was a bunch of people. So we'd love to have you join for that. Um, but I'm, I'm teaching today, and I'm, I'm really excited. Before I jump in, I do want to say uh, it is my, my dad's birthday today. My dad is here. And just a little wave, Dad, just a little wave. Hey! All of you people over here. He's, like, over here. You can't see him. It's fine. But happy birthday, Dad. I love you, and uh, happy that you're here. Sandra as well. I'm glad you're here. So, uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to jump into the Word. This is my buddy Paul. Paul's going to read uh, the Scriptures this morning. We like to st- I know you just got comfortable. You're hanging out. You're sitting down. We're going to stand for the reading of the Word to honor God's Word as well as just to remember. We want to walk it out. We want we wanna to really walk this thing out in life. So please stand for the reading of the Word, and uh, let's focus our attention. This is, this is God's good Word to us this morning. Uh, so the word comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not give up even though our outer person is being destroyed. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, for what is unseen is eternal. And our next reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So Holy Spirit, would you speak to us today? Would you open our minds, our hearts to hear you? We love you. We need you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Please take a seat. Thank you, Paul. So if you didn't catch it from the the scriptures, today we are talking about hope. And uh, I'm just, I'm really excited to to speak on hope because hope is something that I think we need today. We need some more hope. We turn on the news, we sit down, have conversations with our friends, we talk with our families, and it's like, it's, uh, it's looking a little weird out there. I think, uh, I think the message of Scripture does have good news for us, and uh, I'm excited to just, to just talk about that today. We, in this journey with God, um, the premise, the, the thought for today is, as we talk about hope, is that we need to be a people of endurance. Following Jesus requires endurance. So I want, I want to talk about that a little bit. A couple years ago, I, uh, and this is a, a bit of a random story, but I, I, think it's, I think it's a helpful parallel and kind of parable. A couple years ago, I got invited to go and to hike uh, Mount St. Helens. Usually with hiking, there's two groups of people. See if you can find yourself. One side loves a good hike. You love that crisp mountain air. You just can't wait. Is it Saturday? Let's go for a hike. You're here in the Pacific Northwest because you love hiking. The other side... You 
don't understand why you would ever just choose to go walk up a hill. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Yes, a couple of us. I did not grow up hiking. Did not grow up hiking. I had friends in middle school. They would talk to me about their hiking journey. And I was like, I don't get, I don't get it. Can we go play sport? I don't know. Like, what do you mean? Just You're just walking through the mountains? What are you doing? But being in the Northwest and, you know, going through my college time, was invited to, to do some hikes, and I was like, oh, okay, I actually, I get it. Just like for most of you, you're not from, a lot of you are not from here. Majority of people are not from Seattle. You hear about Pacific Northwest, you hear about the hikes, and you're like, all right, I'll, I'll try it out, I'll try it. And uh, you, you, you kind of get the feel for it a little bit. And for me, that was part of, like, my thing. I love a good view. If I go to any city, I want to go to the tallest building, I want to see out, I want to look. The view is my favorite. So to hike is usually a pretty good view. Um, unless you're hiking Rainier and it's cloudy and it's just the worst, you can't see anything, it's just waste your whole day. But when, when I hike, I like to, to jump to the top and, and to look at the, the view. So when I got invited to hike Mount St. Helens, I was really excited because it's before 1980, before it exploded, it was the tall, fourth tallest mountain in, um, in Washington. And I was like, yeah, this is gonna be a quality view. Like, let's go for it. I did not know what I was signing up for. In any way, did not know what I was signing up for. This is how much I didn't know what I was signing up for. The day before, I was at REI, and I was buying boots, like mountaineering boots for the trek. Some of you look at me, you're like, that's fine, that's great. There was, they were not worked in. I got blisters. It was, it was a rough journey. But there was this moment while we were going up the mountain where I realized, I was like, I think we're pretty close. It's been a minute. We've been like, wow, are you sweating? I'm sweating. This is like, whoa, this is, we're working here. And we got to this crest, and you looked up, and I was like, oh, the people are all, all the way up there. Like, they're so small. Like, oh, oh there they are. And, and I'm realizing, like, we are so far from the top right now. We are so far from the top. And it was this moment collectively where we're like, do we want to keep doing this? Are we going to keep going? And people are coming down off the mountain. You're watching. You're like, they didn't make it. They didn't make it. Sorry. Like, see, and we're like, are we going to do this? We had this flip with a group that I was with, and they, they decided, like, all right, we're going to make it. And we, like, had this rally moment. We're like, we're going to go. And we kept, like, encouraging each other. It was like, well, you got it. Like, climb the boulder. I don't know. Like, keep going. It was, but it was this moment of we want to keep, keep getting to the top. We ended up getting to the top, and we got a little picture. Um, you can see, like, just how high up it was. There's my wife, Michaela, taking a very 2015 Instagram photo. And... Uh, <laughs> But it was a good time. <laughs> the reason that I tell the story, it's like, what are we talking about? I did not realize what I was signing up for and the amount of endurance that I needed to get to the top. Just didn't, it just didn't, like, I didn't know. And today, again, I want to talk about our endurance as a follower of Jesus. Because for some of us, we don't realize how much endurance it takes to follow Jesus. For me, I, I met Jesus on the backside of a drug overdose, struggling with drug addiction in my life. Meeting him, I was like, this is so much better. Wow, this is really exciting. Experiencing the love of God, the forgiveness of God, like the goodness of community. It was, it was beautiful. And it was this high moment. It was like better than the different highs that I was experiencing using drugs. But then it, it was oh yeah, life is still tough. I gotta still figure out how to navigate life and do this thing. For some of you, you have that experience. You met Jesus, it was like a high moment, but then it's been, it can be difficult. For some of you, you grew up going to church, it was your thing, you, you know, family rhythm every Sunday, you hang out, you, you, you go and you, you do your thing. And you've gotten older, you've become an adult and you're starting to go, wait a second, is this something that I really wanna do? This is more complex than I thought. There's more worldviews than I thought. How does this work? Does the scriptures really say this? How do I go about this? And you're kind of feeling that tension of, do I really want to keep doing this? Or for some of you, you just, you're getting older, you have kids, and all the rhythms of kids and, and work and all the pressures, and you just start to kind of slowly feel like, do I have what it takes? Do I want to keep doing this thing called following Jesus? Because this is a lot. And for some of us, again, we just don't recognize 
the amount of endurance that it takes to keep moving. Jesus himself, he promised us, this is, this is a great promise. You ever want to like, thanks Jesus, this is so kind, thanks so much. John 16, what does he say? You will have suffering in this world. Cool, Jesus, thanks man, that's great, that's awesome, appreciate it. One of the, one of the metaphors that he gives of following him is a narrow path. He says, following me, it's like everybody's kind of going one way, but there's actually a narrow path. And how does he describe the narrow path? He says, if you decide to journey on it, it will be difficult. So he doesn't shy away from how difficult it will be. He doesn't shy away from how hard it will be. And I think that sometimes churches set people up. They don't set people up. They leave people hanging because they're like, Jesus is the best. He's going to change your life. Happy clappy. Let's be fake positive. And then it like gets real. And you're like, wait a second. How, do, how does this work? Yes, he changes your life. Yes, he's good news. But it's also like you got to still figure out how to navigate the difficult parts of life, and he will not take that out. Like, he promised it's going to be tough. So how do we grow then in our endurance? How do we grow in having resilience, having buoyance, being a person who is going to persevere? Because for me, one of the toughest parts of being a pastor, the seat that I sit in over the last 10 years, is watching people say yes to Jesus to then just start following Jesus to then stop following Jesus. Every single one of us in this room knows that pain, if you follow Jesus today, of somebody that you know that used to be in love with God is no longer following God. You know that person. You know that pain. You know that feeling. And so how do we not become that? How do we not become that person that's like, I'm out. I'm done. I can't do this. I tap. I think we need to grow in our endurance. We have to be people who know how to persevere. So that's what I want to talk about. And, and this is the thought that I'll begin to kind of like break open and flow through for this morning. How do we develop spiritual endurance? This is the thought, and we'll jump into a couple more scriptures. We grow by realizing that our endurance is connected to our hope. Our endurance is connected to our hope. It's kind of like if you've ever been on a run that you're just like sweating, difficult. What is the thought? I'm almost done. I'm going to get there. I'm going to, I can't, oh, I'm going to eat that thing that I love. It's going to be delicious. I'm going to drink Gatorade. Yes, I can't wait, right? It's out there. It's your hope that begins to drive your endurance. This is actually a connection that the scriptures make often. Check this out. This is Paul, St. Paul, just an amazing missionary. He says this in 1 Thessalonians. He says, we recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work, talking to the church in Thessalonica, your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and here we go, your endurance inspired by what? Your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 4.10, he says, for this reason we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God. Why do we labor and strive? Why do we continue to have resilience? Why do we continue to persevere? Because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. He takes it even a little bit further. In Romans 15, he says this. He says, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Did you notice there that even the mode of hope is often felt and lived through endurance? It's, there's, there's such a connection there. My endurance is directly linked to my hope. So this is where, as Christians, hope, everybody has a hope in something. Everybody's thinking about some sort of dream, some sort of hope. That's driving you. It's motivating you. It's a type of engine in your life. But Christian hope, that's why Christian hope is a different type of a thing. The world offers different types of hopes, but Jesus offers a specific type of hope. And I want to just delineate for just a second. There's this professor in Yale. He's a Christian theologian, and he talks about the, the modern mantra of our time, the like modern hope that kind of is just on autopilot, that we might not even realize is there from time to time, that the world offers. 
is this, and I like how simple it is because it's easy to remember. It's the mantra of long, happy, healthy. If I can just live a long life, if I can just do the things that make me happy, and if I can just be healthy in my life, then, then I'm good. That's a good life. And we will kind of set this thing up as a type of a target. With maybe without even knowing it. Sometimes it's even subconsciously like this. And these are, of course, these are not bad things. These are not bad things. To have a long life, to have a happy life, to have a healthy life. They become a type of a target. But if you notice, all three of these things are actually rooted in our circumstances and in many ways in ourselves. Christian hope is something different. It's not rooted in circumstances or just you. It's actually rooted in God. It's rooted in another person. So it's, it's a different way. It's a different posture. And it's, it's actually a type of a hope that can give you things that no other hope ever can. Because I don't know about you, the longer that you live, the more that you're going to realize that this thing, it, that life is a lot more difficult and a lot more complex. And if I just keep holding this thing up as a target, does that actually begin to start to weigh me down and make me feel anxious and make me feel and fall into despair because I can't actually live up to that reality? I actually need God. I need something more than that. I need something more. For me, that's been so much of my journey. Um, I'm, I'm 33 years old. I know I look like I'm like 22. I know I look young. My wife and I, um, we moved down to the city, and we wanted to, we had this dream. Let's come down to the city with our best friends, and let's build a community together. We came down to the city November 2019. COVID hit. January 2020, March 2020, all of a sudden everything gets crazy. And we were in this place of like, I don't really know what we're going to do now because we can't meet with people, we can't talk with people. We couldn't afford a lot. We were living in 450 square feet in Finney Ridge. I then lost this partnership, this job that was going to be able to provide some of the income for us to start this community. My wife lost her job. We're both looking at each other. I don't know what to do. I start driving for Amazon. So check out uh, this little picture that I love of myself. This is a good, fun memory. Think about going back to the buzz cut. I don't know yet. I'm not even an Amazon employee. I'm just putting packages in my car, driving them around, trying to, to make money, living in 450 square feet. And all of my dream, my hope of coming to the city was shattered. Two, two of our good friends, Richard and Delina, they, they came with us. Everybody else that made promises to come hang didn't. And so it was like this gut-wrenching season of my life, gut-wrenching. I remember one day I was just literally on the floor of my bathroom bawling my eyes out. Michaela, like, came in, like, are you okay? <laughs> no, she was very, <laughs> she was, that was not her at all. She's, like, very kind and, you know, just, like, talking to me. And I was just, just wrecked. And some of you are like, really? But this was like, this was like, a, like, let's come down to, this was a hope of mine. And I realized through that, that, you know what, these packages might as well be gifts that God has given me, because I realized in that season that my hope was actually more in my dream of ministry than it was in God himself. This might as well be a bunch of gifts that God just gave to me. I think that maybe for you, your dream is not like, cool, you're a pastor, that's a, that's a weird dream, man. Maybe for you, it's, it's, not, it's something different, but you have a hope, you have a target, you have something. And oftentimes, when that something begins to eclipse God himself, there's gonna be a time where, where that dream is actually not gonna be fully fulfilled or be as good as you want it to be, and it's going to become a type of a heaviness that pulls you down. But when your hope is in God, you actually will be able to be anchored. It's different, it's different. Christian hope is a different thing. One author says, this is Philip Yancey, I, says, I love you, he says, the main emotion of the adult American is disappointment. I mean, that is, whoo, let's get honest for a sec. I wonder if that's true because we have misaligned hopes that do not provide. Our target 
is not actually giving us what we want and what we can, what we can have. So Christian hope then is a whole different thing. So check it out. Titus 2, this scripture, I think. So what is, what is Christian hope then? What's the difference? What are, we ta- what are we talking about? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While, here's the point. Here it is. While we wait for the blessed hope, what is the blessed hope? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to cleanse us for himself, a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. The hope, the Christian hope, is different than our circumstances. It's actually rooted in a person. Christian hope is about a who. It's not just about a what or a how. I like what one author says, by saying, hope is not created from the character of the present, but from the character of God. That is really brilliant. Oftentimes, we will navigate through life and we'll begin to pick out. We try to, if, you're, if you're optimistic, you'll go through life and you'll look at your circumstances and your day and your, your situation and you'll go like, I can find something good here. Like, let me pull this out. Let me look at this. If you're pessimistic, you're looking at your circumstances and you're going like, nah, it's not gonna work. This is this thing, this thing, and this thing. But both of those modes of being, both of those ways of looking at the world, you're still just focused on your circumstances. Long, happy, healthy. Jesus offers something completely different. He actually short circuits it. It's not just about circumstances, it's about him as a person. Why? Because if he's in the mix... Something is about to shift. Something is about to change. It's like, have you ever gone somewhere where you are happy that that person's gonna be there with you? You're like, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. I don't know. Oh, but that person's gonna be there. And because they're gonna be there, it's like gonna, it's gonna make, that's gonna make the situation a lot better. You don't know all the details. You don't know how it's all gonna go out. You don't know what's gonna happen or what people are gonna say. But because they're there, Okay, okay, I think, I think that that will be, I think it'll be good. I can trust that person. This is more of what Christian hope looks like. It's, it's about a person who helps us reorient and re-see reality as we know it. It's a shift. Wait a second, that person's there. And part of the reason that this is good news with Jesus is because of who he is and what he's promised to do. He is somebody that we can look at and go like, I'm so glad he's there. I'm so glad that he's going to show up in our situation. The, the messianic profile, this promise of God, was this king that would enter in and help everyone come into this type of golden age. This, this Messiah is going to show up almost like some sort of political office. And just as somebody that's holding a political office has this mantra of, this is how we're gonna do the things that we do. These are the promises that I'm going to make. The Messiah was that type of a figure. Usher in the golden age to change everything. So Jesus shows up and begins to do things that people are going like, wait a second, is this the Messiah? Wait a second, it's different than what I thought. Wait a second, is is this really the person that's gonna change everything? And as the story goes on, there's this showdown where the, the corrupt Roman officials, the government officials of the day, why did they kill Jesus? Wasn't Jesus just about love? No, he was threatening the whole system. He was, he was threatening the whole way of being because he was making some big claims about who he was and what he was like. So in that storyline, all of a sudden there's this showdown in Rome and everybody's thinking, oh, here we go. The Messiah is gonna overthrow this whole thing and there's gonna be life. They're gonna shift it. It's gonna change. This is gonna be amazing. And yet Jesus goes into the grave. This is so much of what was so devastating about Jesus dying. They didn't understand that actually Jesus dying was part of the plan. And in that, through his death and through his resurrection, he opened up a way for us to come back into an intimate relationship with God. 
But his resurrection, go with me for a second, his resurrection, it wasn't just some supernatural show of power. It was actually the start of the new creation that the Messiah promised. In 1 Corinthians 15, there's this phrase. Look at this. It's a metaphor. Paul says this. He says, as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. A metaphor of first fruits. First fruits is an agrarian metaphor. Looking at me, you can tell I'm not a farmer. It's an agrarian metaphor. <laughs> That means the first fruits that pop up, and it is a promise of the remaining harvest. It's a promise of what's to come. So Jesus, as the first fruits then, is a type of what will come in the future. He's the first fruit. What does that mean? Well, it means that his resurrection was a launch of the new creation that the Messiah has promised. And it happened in a way that nobody would have ever expected. Everyone thought there'd be a showdown, the Messiah would show up, and everything would shift in a moment. But Jesus, being God, had something different at play. This is where one, one author, he says this. See if you can follow along with this. It says, the resurrection was indeed a miraculous display of God's power, but we should not see it as the suspension of the natural order of the world. Rather, it was the beginning of the restoration of the natural order of the world, the world as God intended it to be. It was the start. It was the flash. It was the launch of the new creation. Because God's whole plan in the beginning was to create this paradise where God and humanity lived together. There was a sense of growth where humanity was taking God's project somewhere with God in relation to each other, this beautiful garden paradise that was set up. And through that, that it would grow towards a type of civilization, community, life-giving space that would move towards a city. In the end, what do we see in Revelation? We see a city coming down to live this new creation, God and people once again. It's a full circle type of a moment. So God didn't just like drop kick his project. He actually continued the project and is continuing it even today. So part of when we talk about heaven, what we're talking about is this new creation, this thing that God wants to continue doing. And look at for a second, some of the promises of that. Just, just go with me, because I can see a little bit like, what? Go with me for a second. 1 Corinthians 2.9, this new creation, this new thing that God's going to do, this new setup, it says this, no eye has seen, no eye has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. What God is going to do in Christ, in the Messiah, is so good that we actually can't even comprehend it. That the best thing that you could think about, the best setup, the best way that God could go about whatever eternity begins to look like, it doesn't even come close to what you can think about. The Eden ideal, this paradise, this setup, this beauty, it can only act as a form of kindling to help us in our imagination think about what God will do in the new creation. It's that good. It's hard, it's, it's like, it's even hard to even, it so, feels so philosophical, like how do you even comprehend that? Ephesians 3.20 says, now to him, talking about God, who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Our type of, our God, the best that we can think of, the best thing that we think that he can do, it doesn't come close to what he one day will do. So this is what I'm trying to say. And, and I'm gonna kind of break down like, well, what do you, like, what is, do we have any picture of that? We'll, we'll kind of go through a list quickly. But this is what I'm trying to say. This is the whole point. In Christ, all of what you really want is on the way. In Christ, all of what you really want in your life right now is on the way. We have different desires, like there's different levels in our hearts. Sometimes we have a surface desire that sometimes it's just like, ah, 
Like, I'm hungry. I, like, I really want that or, or this. And sometimes we have these desires that we know, like, uh, I probably shouldn't really want this or, like, be about this. But then there's, like, these deeper desires. You sit and you watch a movie, and all of a sudden you have, like, this emotional experience. You start crying. You're like, there's something down there. You're sitting at a funeral, and you're recognizing the fragility of life, and you're going like, wait a second, there's something more underneath all of the frenetic aspect of life and all of my to-do list. Like, there's something down there. That place, what you really want in life, all of it is on the way in Christ. You have, you have bought the Amazon package, and that thing is shipping. It is coming your way. You are waiting. You are, you are loading the, the, the app. Is it, is it here yet? Is it here yet? Well, how many days? It's on the way. Can I remind you of some of what God has promised this morning? There's coming a time where life will be lived in the fullness of God's unending love. Have you ever had a moment where you so knew that God loved you? I was like, oh, is it, is it a phone? Is it a police? Okay. I was like, Have you ever had a moment maybe in worship where you just knew God loves me. You experience his presence in some way. What is it gonna be like to live into an existence where the whole time that you are living, you are experiencing God's great, perfect presence? What is that gonna be like? There's coming a time where you're gonna live in life-giving community. Part of what God is going to do in Christ is to bring about a sense of harmony. You know when you're sitting with family around a table and you're laughing and life's good, or maybe it's a group of friends, and you're just like, I feel so whole, I feel so loved, I feel so seen right now. What is it gonna be like to live into that existence for eternity? That all relationships will be in harmony and there's gonna be love? What is that gonna be like? There's coming a time where we're gonna be given a new body. Part of the promise of the new creation is not that we would become angels and put on a little diaper and float around with wings, is that we would actually be given a heavenly body. We don't fully know what it's going to look like or what the differences are gonna be. You can read this in 2 Corinthians, but we're going to get a new body that's perfect, that doesn't decay, that doesn't have any type of disease, that's going to be free of pain. What is that going to be like? There's coming a time where we're gonna get to live in a city that we call home. There's gonna be safety and abundance. Some of us, we feel so houseless. We feel so alone. We've moved, we've jumped around. We don't feel like we have a place that's like ours. There's gonna be a God. There's gonna be a time where we're gonna get to live in a type of community in a city with each other where God is the architect. Now, I don't know about you, God's built some, have you seen how the things God's made? I mean, mountains are pretty cool. The ocean, that's pretty, like, good job, God. That's a, that's, that's a 10 out of 10. What's it gonna be like if God, it says the, the, the architect is God himself? What's that gonna be like? There's coming a time where we're gonna continue in meaningful co-creating with God. It's not like we're just gonna just be or hanging out and it's gonna be boring. There's actually these scriptures that are really interesting where talking about the faithfulness today is actually gonna in some way lead into eternity. If it, there's, this, there's this metaphor, this parable that he gives. He says, if you're, you know, you're faithful with the little today, this is Jesus, you know, in the, in the age to come, in the new creation, I'm gonna give you rule over 10 cities. It's like, what does that mean? I don't know. But there's in some form, there's this full circle moment where we're still going to continue to get to do meaningful work with God. We're gonna get to, like that heart's desire to have meaning in life that's going to continue. All the pressure that you're putting yourself, all, your, all the pressure you're putting your career on right now, I gotta have the perfect career because like this is my life. Well, actually, you're gonna get to live into an entire eternity with some form of meaningful work with God. So how does that begin to like shape my life? There's coming a time where there's gonna be a great reversal of corruption. All of the people, all of the systems, all of the institutions that have pushed other people down to prop themselves up, God is going to flip it on its head. And there's gonna be a time where there's no longer gonna be people that are on the underneath side of all of that injustice. He's gonna change it. He's gonna show up and say, no, no, this is not how we do things here. What is that type of existence gonna be like? There's coming a time where all suffering will end. All of it. 
We will not suffer or struggle. It says we will weep no more. When this really starts to get into our bones, when this really starts to get in, it begins to shift how we live our lives. Because if this is true, I can go through anything in my life because I know that a new day is about to dawn. This is why hope is connected to endurance. Because if I really hope in this, then I can get through anything in Christ and I can continue to endure because this is on the way. It's a different posture. It's a different way of being. It's a different mode of existing. I'm not just digging through my circumstances trying to be optimistic. I'm realizing that God is with me and God has a plan for the future. And if he's in the future, I don't know what the exact details are gonna look like, but I know it's gonna be good because I know my God is good. That is Christian hope. It's a different thing. And it is a type of hope that the world cannot offer us. All the world can offer us is circumstances, better circumstances, more pleasure in life, less pain in life, long, happy, healthy. It's all the world can give us. But then all of a sudden suffering hits like it does because Jesus promised that life is hard and we are floundering, have no place But Jesus today wants to remind you and give you a hope that the world cannot give and it provides an endurance like nothing else can. Everything you want is on the way in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, same scripture that we started with. In light of remembering some of what Jesus has promised you, let this sink in now. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Can I ask you, where's your focus been? Because for me, I fight focusing on hopes that don't actually provide all of what I need. I wrestle that. Wrestle it. But when I can really begin to lean into the truth, of what Jesus is offering, what Jesus is providing, hope doesn't make me passive. It's an engine for perseverance. I'm not just like sitting there like, I just, I hope one day. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean in because I know, the be- literally, it's a cheesy phrase, but it's true in Christ. The best is actually yet to come. All the pressure you're putting on yourself to have the perfect life, to live, to live the most meaningful, get all the experiences, get everything out of life, all that, we are, we are scratching the surface of what our existence will be all into eternity. Think about it. A hundred years from now, for every single person in this room, the thing that is going to matter most is their relationship with God. Is this plan, is this thing that God has for all of us? So why do we forget and why do we have a hope that's targeted on something that doesn't provide? I know I struggle with that for sure, for sure. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a moment to just allow that truth and the truth of scripture to like bring it into your life for a second. Cause it's still, it can feel like philosophical. It can feel out there. But that reality that is on the way in Christ is more real to you than anything else. So we're gonna sing this song. Richard's gonna lead us. And the hope for this time is for you to just take a moment to connect with God. To be able to just slow down. And where where does that hope begin to help you have endurance? Like where do you need to just like, no, I'm gonna keep going. Or maybe it's like, you know what? I've, I've been sitting for a little bit. There's a lot of study right now about quiet quitting. It's this idea of like, you're not quitting your job, but you're showing up for your job, even though you hate your job, you're kind of just going through the motions, you're, you're quiet quitting. So 
Sometimes we can quiet quit on Jesus where we're just like sitting there and I'm at church, I'm in small group, I'm hanging out, but I'm not actually like, I'm not actually like doing the thing. So where can you remember and allow that hope to kick into endurance today? Jesus is the greatest thing that we could ever, the greatest person, the greatest way we could ever live, the greatest thing that we're looking for. Nothing else will provide like him. So have, have a space, have a moment, whether you've been following Jesus for a while or you're contemplating even like, I kind of want to follow him now. I kind of want to learn how to live life from him today. Take a moment, you and God, and let Richard just sing over you and then we're going to kind of shift and, and I'll probably begin to sing together. But if you could please stand and take this time to just connect with the Lord. Safe with you. I 
take a moment to pray for anybody in the room that's feeling like a huge sense of hopelessness or pain or struggle. Maybe it's not even necessarily your life, but somebody close to you. We are, the church is supposed to be a type of a body that supports each other. It's like a support, a love, a family. So we're just going to take a moment to, to pray. We had some cool moments on Wednesday at our worship night. God was just really working and moving and showing up. So if you're in a space of just wanting to be bold, I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand. Is there anybody that we can that we can pray for this morning? If there's one person, if there's nobody, awesome, if you could just hold your hand up, if you feel comfortable with people praying for you, just keep your hand up, keep your hand up. There's a couple people, a couple people. So if you are near somebody that has their hand up, um, if you could just, like lay hand on them, pray for them, don't smother them. And if you're not, think about somebody that you know who's going through a difficult time, who's going through a hard time, who's in who's in pain, who's feeling hopeless. And we're as the church gonna show some love and just contend. Can we just ask that God would help the situation, would show up in the moment, would comfort them? So come on, get some love in your heart from somebody, whether it's the person next to you, whether it's the person that you're thinking about that's going through a tough time. And we're just going to start to contend. If you feel comfortable, like you can, even underneath, yeah, in your own words, like in your, like underneath your breath, if you pray, God, we just ask right now that you would show up as the mighty God that you are, that you would bring hope where people feel hopeless. God, where people feel stuck, where people feel like life is just over. There's nothing that I can do. There's no way that I can get out of this situation. Would you show up as God? 
Lord, all over the world, the different places where it just feels hopeless. It feels like what's about to happen, what's about to take place next. God, would you be God? Would you show up? Would you reveal who you are and what you're like? God, we know that you are a God of miracles, that you are a God of good, that you are a God of change and transformation and growth, that you are a God of, of bringing about a new type of paradise. God, would you please bring this now in, into, into the now, not only in the future, but in the now. We trust you today, God. We trust you today, God. We need you today, God. Please, Lord. some healing taking place right now as you all are praying for each other and I don't want to rush the spirit so I just want us to rest in this space for a little bit more let's let our brothers and sisters get what they need in this moment right now there's healing taking place there's deliverance taking place I can literally see things coming off of you right now like I see weight literally just lifting off of you you look lighter as as you are being prayed for right now as the tears flow and as you just let yourself go i see it all around the room right now in the spirit so i'll trust in jesus yeah i'll trust in jesus i'll trust in Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. is 
as long as there is breath in my lungs, still breathing, there is hope in Jesus. Let us keep our eyes on the Lord as we transition into a time of communion together. There should be a cup closer to you. Um, if you could grab the cup as we take time to remember the Lord and the sacrifice for us. The Lord asks that when we meet together, we would participate with our brothers and sisters all around the world as we remember his sacrifice for us and that we can have a hope in him. We get to participate in this to remember his sacrifice, to remember his great love for us, to remember his loyalty for us. And so on the, on the night he was betrayed, the Lord was with his disciples. And scripture reads, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread together as we remember his body broken for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us take the cup to remember his blood shed for us. Thanks, Gloria. So we're going to go ahead and close our, our time together. Um, thanks for being here. Hope that it was meaningful for you. want to remind you to think about or show up at the Wednesday at Green Lake. We'd love to get to meet you and hang out. This church is not just about gatherings. It's about real people connecting to a real God in uh, ordinary ways with our life. So we'd love to have you come hang out. We will be, I'll be there on Wednesday night. We got the social next, the uh, after, sorry, the social next week. We'll have like food to hang out uh, after our second service. So we'd love to have you there as well. But thanks for, for being with us today. One of the things uh, that I would love to ask for your help in, this is a co-working space that we flip every morning. Huge shout out to the facilities team, the connect team, the production team, the worship team. These people are here. Yeah, they're here at like six o'clock in the morning, people. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Nana hits the key. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. We've got a really amazing group of people. If you'd like to help with any way, with any of that, I'd love to have your help. Please come talk to me. Please come talk to Richard. Please come talk to Claire, Amy, Steve. I don't know if, I think Steve jumped out earlier. He does our facilities, but if you could help us stack chairs, that would be amazing. We pull out carts. Dom's about to pull out some carts right here. And we stack the chairs 10 high and uh, rub shoulders with each other. Say hi to somebody, smile at somebody. And uh, yeah, we, we, we stack them. And then uh, if you could help us do that, that would be amazing. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Thank you so much for being with us today and hope to see you next week.